first of all, um, I wanted to thank you for joining me this afternoon to talk about um, how uh, cancer patient could potentially get accommodations at work. Um, but before we jump into that, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Alexis Alvarez. I am a staff attorney with the Cancer Legal Resource Center. And before we jump into our talk about accommodations today, um, I know many of you are, are familiar with, with the CLRC, but um, I did want to uh, go over a little bit about um, what we do here at the CLRC. So we are a, a joint program of uh, the Disability Rights Legal Center and Loyola Law School. Um, as you all know, our, our services are free and confidential, um, and we are based on an educational model. So what that means is we don't provide legal representation or give legal advice, but what we can do is a lot like what I'm going to do today, which is provide information about uh, the laws that might provide uh, protections for uh, people impacted by cancer in different situations. And so today we're going to be talking about uh, the workplace specifically. Um, so if uh, you have any questions today, um, you can always feel free to give us a call. Again, our services are free. And you can always call us at our 866 number on the screen. We also have an intake form available at clrcintake.org. Um, so like I said, if you have any questions that we don't get to today, please uh, feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to help. OK, so I. We're going to start today by talking about the federal and state laws that can provide protection for people with cancer, for people impacted by cancer, and um, caregivers in the workplace. And there are a couple of main laws that I'm going to be discussing today. Um, the, the first is the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, and that is a national law that offers certain protections against discrimination to particular employees, um, and also give those employees the right to on-the-job accommodations, which is our, our focus today. Uh, the Family and Medical Leave Act is another national law that allows for certain employees to take time off from work to take care either of themselves or a family member with a serious health condition. Um, so that'll be the, the second big uh, federal national law that we'll be talking about. There are also state laws that offer some similar protections to the two federal laws I just mentioned, and we'll be exploring those today as well. I did want to emphasize and remind you, however, that it is important to keep in mind that the laws we talk about today, um, those are just the baseline for protection that employers are required to provide. And sometimes employers will provide more protections in their own policies and procedures than the law requires. So it is important, um, you know, if for any reason one of these laws doesn't apply to you or you find yourself needing more protection than the law provides, it's important to look for those additional workplace protections that the employer um, might provide. And you can look in employment documents like your employee manuals or if you're a member of a union, your union contract to see if there are any other protections that your employer provides. You can also always talk to your HR um, or your union representative. So do keep that in mind as we go through and talk about um, the laws that, that can help protect cancer patients and their caregivers in the workplace. Okay, so we're going to start out uh, with an example. We're going to talk about um, Maria. Um, so imagine Maria, she graduated from college a few years ago, and she recently recovered from uh, breast cancer. And she's been working part-time as an administrative assistant at a law office for about two months. That law office has about 200 employees. Um, 
And Maria developed lymphedema after um, having mastectomy. And she's been experiencing pain when she moves her arm. Um, and she's been having a limited range of motion because of that pain. And so she needs to wear uh, a compression sleeve to reduce the pain and be able to have her, her full range of movement. But Maria is worried about having to go to, back to work and, and wear that um, compression sleeve. She's worried because it's not part of the office dress code, and she thinks maybe it might get her in trouble um, because it's not part of the dress code. So what can Maria do in that situation? Well, one of the first laws I'd talk uh, to Maria about is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, it is a federal law that makes it illegal for private employers with 15 or more employees and also public employers um, of any size to discriminate against qualified individuals with disabilities in any stage of the employment process. And that does include the application and interview process. Um, could this law apply to Maria? And if so, how would it help her? Well. First, we need to, to find out whether this law might apply to Maria. And there are a few factors that affect whether or not um, this law might provide her protection. So um, one of the things that's going to affect whether or not this law applies is the size of her employer, whether or not Maria has a disability as it's defined by the ADA, and whether Maria is qualified for her job. Um, so as I uh, as you can see from the slide, um, the ADA does apply to private employers with 15 or more employees. And we know Maria is working for a firm of 200 employees. So it looks like she might fit um, that initial factor of her employer size. But um, is Maria qualified for her job? Well, in order to be qualified to qual to be considered qualified for a job, you do have to be able to perform the essential function of that job uh, with or without reasonable accommodations. The other piece of it is that you must also have a disability. Um, so is Maria considered to have a disability under the ADA? So let's, let's tackle uh, being qualified first. So for an employee to be qualified, um, under the ADA, as I said, that employee has to be able to perform the essential functions of that employee's job. And essential functions are the basic, fundamental, crucial job duties performed in, the, in a position. They're essentially what makes your position what that position is. And um, essential functions don't include any extra or incidental duties. So for Maria, in the case um, of an administrative assistant, um, you know, being able to work at a computer, answer phones, those might be essential functions of her job, but she also might have her, uh, the responsibility in her office of refilling the water cooler. But refilling the water cooler would be an example of, of an extra or incidental duty because even if Maria stopped refilling the water cooler, she would still be doing all the work that makes her an administrative assistant. And some other employee could um, easily take over uh, filling the water cooler. Um, under the ADA, um, you do have to, like I said, be qualified to do your job. And for Maria, I mean, she's been doing the job for, for a couple months, so presumably she was qualified coming in. Um, but now she's having some difficulty uh, with due to the lymphedema in her arm, and it's making it difficult for her to do some of those manual tasks that she might need to do. Um, but when she wears that comp compression sleeve, she gets some relief from those symptoms and would be able to do her work functions as she was performing them before she got the lymphedema. Um, could the ADA help in this situation? Well, under the ADA, um, Applicants or employees who have disabilities are allowed to ask for reasonable accommodations, which include changes to the job or work environment to make it easier for them to perform the essential functions of the job. So, um, and we'll get a little bit more into reasonable accommodations in just a bit, but if we could find a reasonable accommodation for um, 
Maria that could help her perform those essential job functions, then presumably she'd remain qualified for her job. And um, now we'll be moving to uh, whether or not Maria has a disability um, as defined under the ADA. Um, as we were discussing earlier, in order for the ADA to apply to a particular applicant or employee, um, that individual has to have a disability and be qualified um, for the job. And we also, we just talked a lot about whether uh, Maria is qualified for a job, but now we need to um, figure out whether she fits into the definition of disability. Now the ADA has a specific definition of disability. Under the ADA, you are considered to have a disability if you have a mental or physical impairment. That impairment substantially limits a major life activity. Um, well, that impairment limits a major life activity and that limitation is substantial. So there are three pieces to that definition. Um, the impairment, um, the limitation to a major life activity, and that limitation must be substantial. A major life activity is any activity that is of central importance to most people's daily lives. Um, the ADA's definition of major life activities includes things like walking, talking, breathing, um, taking the, having the ability to take care of yourself, uh, performing manual tasks, working. It also includes some major bodily functions. Um, so that includes things like functions of the immune system, um, normal cell growth, um, in some situations reproductive functions. So that, that definition of, of major life activities is pretty broad. For Maria, uh, the lymphedema in her arm is limiting her ability to perform the manual tasks she usually does for her job. But um, as we talked about in the previous slide, it's not enough for Maria's ability um, to perform those manual tasks to be limited. It has to be limited substantially. So what is a substantial limitation? A substantial limitation is an inability to perform a major life activity in the way an average person in society would be able to perform it. And please do keep in mind that when we're talking about um, a substantial limitation, that can be caused you know, not only by um, a diagnosis or illness itself, such as um, for our purpose is cancer, but also by the side effects of treatment. Um, so, you know, if somebody's getting radiation or chemotherapy, um, the, the side effects of that might be substantially impairing um, a major life activity. Uh, maybe there's a lot of fatigue. In this case, Maria's lymphedema, lymphedema was the result of a mastectomy, which is a standard treatment for, for breast cancer. Um, and, and cancer is often considered a disability under the ADA because it and its treatment um, often can and, and, and they do uh, substantially limit major life activities. But the, the, the decision on whether there is a substantial limitation is generally made on a case-by-case -case basis. And some of the things um, that to think about when figuring out whether a, a limitation is substantial is, you know, what kind of limitation it is how severe it is, how long it's been going on, and what impact that, that limitation is having um, on your life. So let's say we've established Maria is a qualified person with a disability who is protected by the ADA. What does that mean for her? It means she might be able to get something called a reasonable accommodation. As I mentioned earlier, a reasonable accommodation is any change or adjustment to a work environment that allows a qualified person with a disability, like Maria, to fully go through the job application process, to complete her job duties, and to, or to get the same benefits as employees or applicants without disabilities. 
And the kinds of accommodations that Maria would be able to receive are going to depend on a couple of things. So her work environment and her own needs and limitations. Whether an employer has to give a particular type of accommodation depends on whether providing that accommodation would be an undue hardship on the, on the employer. So when we say undue hardship, usually what that means is that it's going to cost the employer too much to give you the accommodation. But then again, what costs too much uh, really depends on the specific job and the specific employer at issue. So, for example, what might be really easy for one employer, um, like a you know a big organization like Target, may actually be really difficult for the mom and pop shop down the street. Um, and again, whether or not a certain accommodation is an undue hardship is also decided on a case by case basis. But you know, most accommodations don't um, cost too much. Uh, so once it, it, the determination has been made that you are a qualified individual with a disability under the ADA, you're entitled to request a reasonable accommodation from your employer if you need help to do your job. So um, for Maria, um, as a qualified individual with a disability under the ADA, she now has um, this, this right to request a reasonable accommodation. And um, like I said, this does apply in the uh, application, you know, as, as far back as the application process all the way through to having the actual uh, job. Um, for, for Maria, permission to wear the compression sleeve that she needs to minimize the pain and increase her, her range of movement um, could be a reasonable accommodation, even though it's not part of the dress code, because that would be a change or adjustment in her work environment or the way things are customarily done. So um, this would be a little bit different than what normally fits under the employer's dress code. Um, but it would allow her to be able to perform her, the essential functions of her job. So what are other kinds of reasonable accommodations that a person uh, with cancer might need? Um, some examples could be a shortened shorten work day or a flexible schedule so um, uh, an employee can rest or keep medical appointments or take treatments, maybe working from home uh, for a short time, whether that's part-time or permanently you know, getting some leave for doctor's visits, maybe working longer hours so to, in order to have some additional rest periods um, so to reduce fatigue. I mean, there's really a, a range of things that, that could be reasonable accommodations at work. And again, it's really going to depend on, on what your job is and who your employer is, whether or not that accommodation would be an undue hardship. So, you know, if a surgeon is asking to work from home, that won't really work because a surgeon can't do perform their job functions from home. But um, you know, if you're an analyst and most of your work is done on the computer and you really don't have to interact with other people, um, then maybe in that situation, if your employer has uh, the means for it, you can work um, from home. So that there are a, a lot of options available. And it's important to think about um, what it is your needs and limitations are, um, what it is would help you um, continue to perform uh, your job the way you were doing it before um, this limitation came about. Um, and so again, for Maria, that compression sleeve uh, might be her reasonable accommodation. So when should Maria be asking for this reasonable accommodation. So thus far, Maria hasn't been reprimanded for wearing the sleep to work, um, you know, but she did wear it for a couple of days and an email went around the office uh, reminding the staff of the dress code. 
Um, and so that's when Maria started to worry. If Maria waits until she is reprimanded, she may be subject to discipline even though she needs the compression sleeve for a legitimate reason. When an employee doesn't give notice of the need for an accommodation until after a performance problem has occurred, reasonable accommodation doesn't require that the employer either excuse a poor performance or withhold a disciplinary action um, or raise a performance rating or even you know, give an evaluation that doesn't reflect the employee's actual performance. Um, so it's really important to request a reasonable accommodation as soon as you know you might need one. So for Maria, she's probably going to want to do that as soon as possible because, you know, it, it sounds like um, someone is keeping an eye on the dress code at work, and so um, she might want to do that, ask for that accommodation as soon as possible um, so that a reprimand doesn't come and she doesn't have to deal with whatever the repercussions of that might be. But even if Maria waited um, until she got a reprimand to let the employer know, look, I, I need um, this accommodation when she's being told, you know, you can't, you can't wear that sleeve, it's not part of the dress code. When Maria starts that conversation, even if she does it at that point, um, the employer still does have to go through, you know, a discussion to start that, um, the interactive reasonable accommodation process. So there still does need to be a combination about how um, a particular disability might be affecting performance and what accommodation the employee believes might help to improve it. So even though um, she might wait. Her employer can't refuse to discuss the request or fail to provide an accommodation as a punishment for the performance problem. Um, but if she does wait until then, then there may be, you know, a write-up or something um, as far as the dress code goes. Because at that point, the employer didn't know that Maria needed to wear um, this compression sleeve. So. Um, like I said, it is, it is best to address these issues as soon as you believe they might be coming up. Um, but don't forget that even if, you know, you have this conversation once a problem has been brought to your attention, that there uh, should still be a conversation around um, what accommodations might possibly be needed. Um, and if there is a reasonable accommodation needed and the employer refuses to talk about it or to provide it, um, unless it's an undue hardship, that might be an, uh, a violation of the ADA. Um, so back to Maria, um, she should probably just um, go ahead and go talk to her supervisor or HR department as soon as she can. So how does Maria go about getting that reasonable accommodation? Um, so she probably wants to go and talk to her supervisor or her HR de department. Again, um, after an employee starts that conversation about an accommodation, employers have um, to engage in that um, interactive process, have that conversation. Employers also have, oh, I apologize for that. Let me go back. Um, employers do also have the right to request medical documentation that shows that the accommodation is needed um, and that, uh, you know, that if, if needed, that the employee can perform the job safely with or without the accommodation. Um, and an employer can ask you to fill out a request form um, after you request a reasonable accommodation. So Maria might have to fill out some, some paperwork when she goes to ask about this uh, reasonable accommodation, but um, her employer does have to keep her uh, medical information um, and any information relevant to this request confidential and in a separate file. 
So, um, as I said, once Maria requests permission to wear the compression sleeve as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA, she might need to provide her employer with some medical documentation showing that the compression sleeve minimizes the pain in her arm and improves the range of motion, which is going to then allow her to be able to perform the manual tasks of her job. So. Um, Typically, the medical certification is going to include, um, like I, I, I was explaining, um, what the, the nature and severity and um, how long the impairment is supposed to last, um, what activities are limited. So for Maria, it's her um, range of movement and how substantial that limitation is and why the accommodation is needed. Again, the accommodation here would allow um, Maria to be able to do those um, manual tasks that she is have, having trouble doing um, due to the lymphedema with, without that compression sleeve. Um, but when Maria is, is seeking out uh, that medical documentation, uh, she needs to keep in mind that she's not required to tell her employer that she has lymphedema or that she had breast cancer and this you know, trouble is as a result of a treatment. Um, the only thing that the medical certification needs to include is um, the, the uh, information showing that the patient um, has a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits major life activity. So it's about balance here. Um, your healthcare providers, your healthcare team only needs to provide enough information so that your employment goals are met so you can show why you need the accommodation and how it's going to help, but not so much that there's um, you know, that there's a privacy infringement or um, that the employer has enough information that it might use to discriminate with. Um, and hopefully that doesn't happen too often, but uh, some people are very private about their diagnoses um, and about their just health information in general. And it's certainly um, a personal choice how much uh, you want to disclose, and again, um, Maria um, does not have to share that uh, diagnosis if she doesn't want to do that. And Maria um, is a very private person, so she should probably talk to her health care provider about whether or not she wants her, her medical condition disclosed to the employer. Um, so, you know, that conversation can help because then the employer, uh, excuse me, the, the health care provider, whether it's the doctor or the uh, physician's assistant um, will know to just put in um, what is going on as far as, as symptoms um, and the accommodation. And maybe Maria won't go to his, her oncologist uh, for the paperwork, but she'll go to her primary care physician or the physician's assistant um, you know, so that the paperwork doesn't have oncologist at the top. Um, so Maria can definitely explore those options with, with her healthcare team if she's worried about um, her privacy or just really wants to ensure that, that the information about her situation uh, isn't disclosed to her employer. In addition to the ADA, a lot of states have their um, well, one of the things Maria might want to think about um, in addition to the ADA is that a lot of states have their own state fair employment laws, and 48 of them are really, really similar to the ADA, uh, with the only exceptions being Alabama and Arkansas. Um, some states, like California and Illinois and New York, they have a broader definition of disability in their um, states, mini-ADA, I like to call it, and four states, um, including California, Maine, Ohio, and Vermont, specifically identify cancer as a disability. So if Maria lives in California, um, we'll say she lives here in LA, um, then she um, might also want to look into uh, California's Fair Employment and Housing Act, which is 
uh, California's mini ADA, um, which again provides a, a broader definition of disability and specifically identifies cancer as a disability. Um, and so it might be a little bit easier for her to get uh, protection um, through FEHA, you know, say if uh, her employer is smaller than 15 employees um, in California, you only need uh, five or more employees. And in Illinois, with their state ADA, you only need one or more employees. So depending on where you are, um, it's going to be important to, you know, find out what uh, your state's fair employment laws look like, and you can always contact us here at the CLRC or your fair employment agency um, to find out what protections you have through state law. And you can find a list of the state agencies at our website at cancerlegalresourcecenter.org. And I did see that there are some questions in the question box. Um, I am going to get to those at the end of the presentation, so just um, stick with me and I will uh, address those questions in just a little bit. Okay, so how do we help Maria? How does the ADA help Maria? Well, we know that the ADA enables Maria as a qualified individual with a disability to request permission to wear her compression sleeve even though it doesn't apply, it doesn't conform to the dress code. So Maria's next steps might be to talk to her supervisor about her need to, to wear the compression sleeve and to provide any relevant uh, medical documentation that the employer might request. Now Maria doesn't have to say the words reasonable accommodation or ADA. I mean it can certainly be helpful, but if she goes into her supervisor, into her HR department and says, you know, I'm having um, pain in my arm and I I can't perform my manual tasks as well unless I'm wearing this compression sleeve. Um, can we? Can I do that even though it's not in the? Uh, it's not part of the dress code. Then that right there is, has already started that interactive process. The employer then has the responsibility to discuss that reasonable accommodation with Maria. And if for some reason that was some sort of undue hardship, although I have a very you know hard time thinking of how that could be um, then you know the employer can't just say no we're not going to do it there has to be a conversation an effort on both parts to find uh, an effective resolution that can work for both parties um, and again Maria might have to certify that she has the you know an impairment the arm swelling and pain and um, that it's you know giving her trouble performing those manual tasks and then, you know, have her um, health care provider then indicate that the compression sleeve helps reduce the swelling and the pain and allows her to regain that, that range of motion. If Maria ran into difficulty requesting the accommodation with her uh, supervisor or her employer simply refused to accommodate her out of hand without trying to find any solution, Maria might want to call the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That is the agency that enforces the ADA. Um, again, that's the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC. If uh, there is a state fair uh, employment law that provides protection, she's going to want to contact her state fair employment agency as well. Often, um, you do have to go through your state agency before getting to the federal uh, the federal agency. So again, it's important to check in um, and see whether your state has its own mini ADA um, that might protect you. If Maria were, for some reason, having trouble thinking of an appropriate accommodation, um, then she might want to consult the Job Accommodation Network. Um, the Job Accommodation Network provides some practical advice um, about reasonable accommodations and helps you explore what it is you might need um, to be able to continue uh, performing your job duties and reach your job goals. So they're a fantastic resource for that. 
And um, if Maria wanted to know more about her employment rights and more about reasonable accommodations, then you know Maria might consider calling um, us here at the CLRC um, or a local employment attorney again if she's if she's running in, into um, problems with her supervisor when she tries to request the accommodation um, or, or her HR department. Um, so Maria definitely should keep these resources in mind for the future. And um, I know we've talked a lot about workplace protections while you have a job, um, but people often call us with questions when they're looking for a new job. For example, you know, can a job application ha ask me medical history questions or what do I need to tell my employer, my prospective employer about a cancer diagnosis? Um, you never need to disclose to your employer that you have a medical condition in the application process unless you're asking for a reasonable accommodation or some kind of medical leave. Um, also, you're not required to disclose if you've taken any medical leave in the past or you expect to take it in the future. Um, those questions should not be coming up in an interview or um, an application. Um, but again, it is up to you how much you want to disclose to uh, a prospective employer. So if you do decide this is something I, w I need to talk about so that I feel comfortable going into this job, um, if you do bring it up, then the employer can obviously ask you if, if you will need a reasonable accommodation in the job um, without, without running into trouble. Um, so if for any reason Maria in the future needed to look for a new job, she wouldn't have to explain that she had to ask um, you know, for a reasonable accommodation at a previous job or um, had had to take some medical leave um, or reveal that she ever had breast cancer. Um, so Maria should keep that in mind just for future reference if, if um, she decides, you know, at some point she wants to move on from the firm and, and try and find employment elsewhere. Another place um, that Maria might con consider contacting um, is the Cancer and Careers. They're a, a fabulous resource for answering questions about practical aspects of being a person with cancer in the workplace. So, you know, they can answer questions about how do I address an employment gap in my resume? Um, what if my employer asked me in the interview what I was doing during that time? Um, they have some great practical advice on how to tackle those issues. Uh, so I highly uh, recommend that you um, either visit their website or, or give them a call. Uh, their phone number is on their website. Um, and if anybody does need that, I can, I can always um, pull that up before I, before I leave here uh, the presentation today. Okay, so next we're going to imagine Daniel. Now, Daniel has been working as a store manager for the past year. Um, he's re he was recently diagnosed with colon cancer, and so he knows that he's going to need to take some time off for treatment, but he's afraid that if he takes the time off, he might lose his job. So Daniel is now wondering if there's any way to take time off, you know, if for, for treatment, maybe surgery, and, and still keep his job. So we've already discussed how the ADA can protect an employee from discrimination in the workplace and how it could potentially help Maria with a request for reasonable accommodation. Now, Daniel could potentially request you know, a reasonable accommodation under the ADA, maybe a, a flexible schedule to start his treatment. Um, but that might not work for him if he starts to feel ill enough that he needs to stay home, or maybe he has to undergo surgery, um, or maybe for some reason for a particular employer, a flexible schedule is, is not something that they can do. Um, that might not work so well for Daniel, but that is not Daniel's only option. So there is a federal law called the Family Medical Leave Act, or FMLA, um, as 
it's commonly referred to. That's what you're going to hear me say. Um, the FMLA allows certain employees to take up to 12 work weeks of unpaid but job and health benefit protected leave a year to either take care of themselves or a seriously ill uh, family member, um, whether that's a spouse, a parent, or a child. In order to take medical leave under the FMLA, um, Someone does have to have a serious health condition, whether that's the employee or the covered family member. Um, and if you're, the employee is taking time off for their own serious health condition, they do have to be unable to perform their job. And you know, from, from that, it sounds like the protections available under the FMLA might be just what Daniel's looking for. Um, but again, we'd have to figure out whether or not these protections apply in Daniel's situation. First, uh, to take FMLA leave, Daniel would have to be taking time off, as I said, to take care of his own serious health condition or that of a covered family member. Here, um, we know that, that Daniel um, is the one who, with the, the health condition, and he's going to need to take leave to take care of himself. Um, so what is a serious health condition? A serious health condition is uh, one that requires continuous treatment by a health care provider and renders you unable to do your job. And often, people who are undergoing cancer treatment, like Daniel, are almost always going to fall under the definition of having a serious health condition because whether you're going through chemotherapy, radiation treatment, surgery, um, you're likely to be receiving care on a continuous basis. Also, um, the effects of surgery or cancer or radiation treatments or chemotherapy um, could certainly make Daniel unable to perform his job. The next thing Daniel should probably consider is how much time he can take as FMLA leave. Um, FMLA provides a up to 12 weeks. Um, a 12-week period of job and health benefit protected leave. Um, that leave is unpaid, um, but again, it is job and health benefit protected, which means your health benefits have to continue once you go on leave at the same in the same way that they were being provided to you before you left uh, work. So, if Daniel's employer was covering 75% of his health care premium. The employer would have to continue to do that when um, Daniel went on FMLA leave. Um, and those 12 weeks that the FMLA provides, they can be taken all at once or in a 12-week block of time or in intervals, uh, for example, you know, one week a month for chemotherapy or every third Friday off for a follow-up appointment. Um, but uh, Daniel does need to keep in mind that that intermittent leave um, can only happen if it's medically necessary. So say Daniel was going to be starting chemotherapy um, and wanted to take um, every Friday off for that appointment, uh, his employer might uh, request that he provide a certification showing um, you know, that having that Friday off um, taking leave on that intermittent basis is necessary to provide that treatment uh, to Daniel. Um, and if this were in the case of, you know, say it was Daniel's father who had the colon cancer and um, Daniel was going to need to go with his father to his appointments um, every Friday, then he might have to provide a documentation showing that he needs to be there to provide psychological comfort um, on you know, the day a week when his father gets treatment. So if Daniel were to undergo surgery, for example, um, he might need to take that full 12 weeks off. Um, but again, if he's going to go in, uh, undergo some, some more sporadic treatment, intermittent treatment like chemotherapy or radiation, he may only need to take um, the days he receives the treatment off. Um, and keep in mind, employers cannot force you to take more time off than you actually need. So if Daniel only needs 
you know, half a day on Fridays for treatment because he bounces right back, um, then the employer can't say, no, you have to take the entire day off. Um, they have to calculate FMLA using the smallest increment of time um, that the employer would normally account for other types of leave. So if the employer calculates leave and blocks a three-hour shift, then um, you know missing two hours and, and 30 minutes um, would count as one shift. But missing three hours couldn't count as missing a full day of work. So Daniel also needs to find out um, whether he works for an employer to whom the FMLA applies. In order for FMLA to apply, the employer must be either a public employer, whether that's a, a local, state, or federal agency, or a private employer with 50 or more employees who work within a 75-mile radius of the um, employee's primary work site. So wherever Daniel goes to check in to work, um, there need to be 50 or more employees within a 75-mile radius of, uh, in his case, his store. Now we know that there are 50 employees at Daniel's branch, so it looks like FMLA would apply to his employer. But um, even if Daniel works for a covered employer, he also needs to make sure that he's a covered employee, which means he's worked for his employer long enough to be eligible for FMLA leave. One way um, that Daniel could think about FMLA eligibility is to remember um, that FMLA protections are reserved for the employee of the year. Um, so you do have to have worked for the employee, for the employer, excuse me, for at least one year. Um, that doesn't need to be consecutively. So if Daniel were a, a seasonal employer, a seasonal employee, and had worked six months for the employer last year and six months this year, then um, he could meet that that year requirement. Um, and in addition to that that year requirement. The employee does have to have worked for an employer for at least uh, 1,250 hours during the 12 months um, immediately before that person wants to start leave. So say Daniel wanted to start his leave March 1st, he would have to have worked 1,250 hours since last March to be able to qualify for FMLA leave. And we know that Daniel has been working for his employer for the past year, so he meets that one-year requirement. And we also know that he's been working uh, full-time, which means he's probably met that, that 1,250-hour requirement. Generally, um, if you have a 50-week uh, uh, work 50 work week year, then you need about 25 hours a week to meet, to meet this goal. So Daniel seems to be in pretty good shape. Um, but another thing Daniel needs to, to, to keep in mind is that if for some reason the employer has not been keeping track of his work time, then the employer is going to have the burden to show, no, he hasn't met these, these requirements. So the employer, is, it's on the employer to keep accurate records of the employee's work time as far as FMLA goes. So now that we know that the protections of FMLA probably apply to Daniel, we're going to move on to some more practical aspects about how Daniel would go about getting the time off. Um, if uh, an employee is asking for FMLA leave, an employer can ask for documentation from a health care provider uh, that shows that there's a medical need for the leave. So Daniel might need to provide his employer with his health care provider's certification for, um, of the need uh, for FMLA leave. And the certification should include the date on which the serious health condition began, um, how long it's probably going to last, um, and a statement that uh, the employee is unable to work um, that is, he is unable to perform one or more of the essential functions of the position because 
of the serious health condition. Um, but again, the identity of the condition or the diagnosis is not required, um, which Daniel is really happy to hear because he wants to keep, um, like Maria, he wants to keep his cancer diagnosis private. Um, so he's not required to provide that information. And um, his employer does need to give him at least 15 days to obtain that, that medical documentation. Similarly, if Daniel's father were the one with colon cancer and Daniel were asking to take FMLA leave to take care of him, his employer could ask for documentation showing that there's a need for the leave. Um, the health care provider's certification in this case would include, again, the date on which his father's serious health condition began, how long it's probably going to last, and um, a statement that the employee is needed to help provide care for the family member at that time. Again, um, at no time does the identity of the condition or diagnosis need to be disclosed, even if it is for a family member. Um, so uh, Daniel does not need to disclose uh, any diagnosis, whether it, it were for him or for his father. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Daniel would prefer to keep his diagnosis confidential, but he's not really sure how to go about doing that. Um, Daniel should know that employers are required to comply with all applicable laws of, of um, confidentiality of medical information, which means the employer has to keep any medical information or records separate from personnel files in their own file to protect privacy. Um, if Daniel is still concerned about um, whether or not the employer is going to find out about a particular diagnosis, um, then it's a good idea for him to be proactive in his conversations with his health care team about medical center certification. Just like Maria, he's going to want to go talk to whoever's providing that documentation um, and uh, say, you know, I don't want them to know what my medical condition is. If you could just provide enough information about the symptoms to show um, that this is necessary, um, then Daniel could um, get uh, get that get that proactive step in and minimize the chances that that there will be any confidential information disclosed. Um, CLRC does have a, a pretty helpful handout on the types of information that have to be in a medical certification and, more importantly, what doesn't have to be in there. Um, and uh, Daniel could access that online at our website, um, or he could give us a call. So uh, same for, for my listeners out there. Um, if you'd like some more specific information about what a medical certification needs, uh, please do feel free to, to contact us or visit us on our website. Um, one thing I did want to be sure and mention is that while uh, um, an employee is on an FMLA leave, uh, the employee is on unpaid leave, but in some circumstances an employer can require um, or the employee could choose to use any accrued vacation or paid time off at the same time so that um, that employee is, is getting paid while on leave. Similarly, um, an employer could require and uh, or an employee could choose to use sick leave if um, he or she would t were taking medical leave for um, his or her own serious health condition. So uh, for example, Daniel might want to use his, his sick time while he's out on leave if he has no other source of income coming in. Um, Daniel should also keep in mind that in addition to the federal protections, um, there are 11 states and the District of Columbia that have enacted um, state FMLA laws. Those states are California, Connecticut, Hawaii, Maine, Minnesota, New Jersey, Oregon, Rhode Island, Wisconsin, uh, Vermont and Washington. If Daniel lives in one of these states, it's going to be really important for him to find out if whether any additional protections are afforded to him under state law. Um, most states' FMLA-type laws are 
pretty similar to the FMLA, but some states do offer additional protections. And to find out more about that, Daniel could visit um, the U.S. Department of Labor's website or uh, give us a call again. Um, these laws that we've been talking about provide the baseline. It is going to be important for Daniel as well as Maria to look through their employee manuals and their employee um, policies, employer policies, to make sure that there aren't any additional protections available to them. And okay, well, what happens if Daniel reaches the end of his 12 weeks, but he hasn't fully recovered from surgery and needs more time before going back to work? Um, it's important for Daniel to know that the FMLA can work alongside the ADA. So if he took 12 weeks of FMLA leave, but we're not ready to return to work, there is a possibility that he could get additional leave as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. Um, but uh, courts have held that the ADA doesn't protect erratic and unplanned absences um, and that attendance is generally a basic job requirement. So if Daniel is asking for additional leave beyond FMLA um, as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA, it can only be a reasonable accommodation when there's a definite end to the leave um, so that the absence isn't posing an undue hardship to the employer. So Daniel might be eligible for the 12 weeks and then have a doctor's note that says he needs an additional five days off for recovery. Um, that could be treated as a reasonable accommodation. It would probably be hard for the employer to say, you know, five more days is going to be an undue hardship. But if Daniel comes to work and says, I mean, sends documentation to work that says, you know, I have no idea when I'm going to be coming back in, um, then the employer is probably going to say that that's an undue hardship and that they can't just keep his, his employment open indefinitely. Um, so depending on what happens with Daniel's surgery, uh, that's an option that he might want to explore. And if he needed some more information, um, he could definitely contact the U.S. Department of Labor or uh, give us a call. So um, as we've talked about, Daniel likely falls under the FMLA. Um, he might have to provide some documentation that he has a health condition and he won't be able to come to work because of that condition. Um, and he can provide, you know, medical info that shows that without disclosing his, his diagnosis. Um, if Daniel didn't fall under the FMLA, say um, his employer was a smaller employer, they didn't have um, those 50 employees, again, Daniel's going to want to check out his employment manual. Or if he's a member of a union, he's going to want to check out his union contract um, and his state law to see if, if there are any other protections available to him. And if the leave is short enough, um, like getting, you know, a day for treatment, um, that kind of thing, then it's possible he could get an accommodation under the ADA. So Daniel does have some options, even if for some reason FMLA were not able to help him out. Um, so that is it for our presentation today. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, and I am going to uh, move on to...